Good afternoon, good afternoon. This is Dr. Scandalberry, and today is Wednesday, March 20th, and we have entered into spring. Can you imagine that? We have now began a spring as of yesterday evening, so welcome everyone. This is uh, Facebook Live, the Dialysis Patient Citizens. Again, my name is Dr. Scandalberry, and I am the medical consultant for dialysis patient citizens. So I hope you guys are here and uh, able to comment. Uh, hello, Julie. Julie Lynn Nash, thank you for joining. My name is Dr. Scanderberry and I am the medical director for dialysis patient citizens. So. Thank you for joining. I'm here to answer your questions, whether you are on dialysis, waiting for a kidney transplant, whether you are a kidney transplant recipient and are doing well, and you know someone who uh, is on dialysis or someone who needs uh, help or just needs some reassurance, needs some guidance about how they're doing, I know for many people, starting dialysis is kind of scary. Uh, and also the whole process of, you know, do I have to stay on dialysis for the rest of my life? Uh, understanding the choices. These are things that uh, we as, uh, as, as either health professionals or even you as, as patients can advocate to help others along the journey. And that is so critical because uh, you certainly have gone through the process uh, and or your family have gone through the process and so you're more aware of what's, what to expect and uh, maybe you're more knowledgeable compared to those who are now entering the phase of making that decision of should I stay on hemodialysis, what is perineal dialysis uh, like, uh, uh, should I right away at what point should I get evaluated for a transplant? How long should I wait? Uh, what is the story about can I get transplanted even before I go on dialysis? Uh, uh, many people are not aware of that and uh, many people start dialysis process especially those who are diagnosed acutely uh, because they weren't aware that it was forthcoming as some patients will end up needing that emergency treatment because they uh, somehow got blindsided, they weren't given enough time or didn't have enough time to plan. And so what happens is they end up with that acute dialysis where a catheter is placed uh, in their neck area, this is what they call subclavian vein, and that, that catheter is then used to dialyze that patient. It's meant to be short term. The goal is that that is a bridge because you need that, that dialysis that's uh, unexpected, but you have to be done. And so once that catheter is in, uh, there you, you should, the discussions should then move towards a more permanent source, especially if they feel that it's not an acute event and that this is going to be uh, something that will happen over time. That catheter is only meant to be there for a few weeks. The longer you keep that catheter, uh, the more issues you will create with that vein. Uh, and that catheter can cause obstructions, stenosis, uh, even recurrent infections. And so, especially if, uh, generally, if you need to have vein mapping for AV fistula, what happens is this vein that the catheter is placed becomes narrow and now you have poor drainage uh, from your AV fistula where you make that connection. And so the goal is, yeah, some people, as uh, Julie says, she had a catheter for two years. It's not meant to keep in place that long, but everyone is different. Some people have no access. Some people may get a catheter and they're out of access and that it's, uh, it's something they need because they don't have, they've had multiple AV grafts, uh, they've had fistulas or uh, other things have compromised the ability, but like I said, the issue with catheter and the infections can also be a, a problem. So 
the longer you live, you stay with that catheter, oftentimes you will, they may change it for another site. Some patients will get infected, um, uh, infections in that catheter because it goes directly from the skin into the vein. Uh, and oftentimes keeping that site clean, changing that site, uh, keeping that under control, but it's meant to be a bridge. And so the short amount of time that you have it, the better. The transition, some people may have an AV fistula place or graft, or even if you go for peritoneal dialysis, the goal is to allow that access to mature, to heal, and to then be ready to be used for dialysis. And when that happens, whether it's uh, six weeks, whether it's two months, uh, if it needs to be revised, then you would, the surgeon will revise that your access and now you're ready to go to go on to long-term uh, dialysis using something that can be used on a regular basis. And then you could save your, um, your vein up here because once these become obstructed, you have drainage from uh, problems. You get varicosities because the, the blood cannot get up to your arm. Uh, and so it can be be it can it can become a problem. So thank you very much uh, for that question. Um, Julie talked about uh, the fact that that uh, catheters are certainly a huge risk risk for infection, but you have to take care of it. You have to keep it dry. Uh, you have to keep it clean uh, and uh, make sure that you are doing the best to prevent infection. So you can't, uh, especially in the summertime, if you're sweating a lot and uh, it gets, it, the, the edges roll up, you have to make sure that you're changing that and keeping it free of infection. Uh, thank you for that. The goal really is that if you get an infection uh, around that catheter, oftentimes you can get a catheter site infection, but you can also carry those bugs into your vein. Uh, so the, the, if that infection then goes into your blood system, then you can get uh, what we call bacteria uh, in your blood, bacteremia, uh, and that bacteria can go to various other organs and reside and take residence and cause severe illness. So sepsis is when your body is taken over from a source of infection it can be from your catheter for many patients. Uh, it can be if they had cellulitis on their leg. Uh, for patients, it can be from a urine infection that then travels from the urine uh, to the kidneys, then get into your bloodstream. And once it gets into the bloodstream, it causes severe uh, fevers, rigors, chills, and it can uh, go to different places. Uh, you can drop your blood pressure. For some patients, they can become severely ill that they then have to receive uh, medications to maintain their blood pressure. They get to be hydrated. They have to have double or three forms of antibiotics to try to combat the different blood organisms that are in your system. So it becomes important to prevent a source of infection. So it's, we want to nip those in the butt early Certainly if it's just an exit site, same thing with a PD catheter, uh, you can have an exit site infection, but if it goes deeper, you will develop peritonitis and that those bacteria will get inside your abdomen, which then cause you know, a belly full of uh, infections with white cells and, and bacteria, your exudate gets cloudy, uh, and that can then get into your overall uh, uh, vascular system which can pre then predispose you to pneumonia, it can predispose you to kidney infections, and it can travel throughout your body uh, to cause uh, havoc. And for many people, that requires a hospitalization to get treated with antibiotics, and some patients will then need to go home on antibiotics because this, this infection, that sepsis, can be quite devastating. So the goal is often making sure that you avoid infection. So people who are diabetic with wound ulcers, uh, foot ulcers, uh, any source of infection, you want to bring that to the attention of your doctor so that um, you can be treated for it appropriately. Keep asked the question, can you explain what BK disease is? Well, BK is actually a 
we call it BK virus actually. BK stands for the initials of the very first patient who they diagnosed BK viruses. And it's a polyoma virus where it is just pretty common in our population. About 80% of the people have this polyoma virus, uh, but it doesn't necessarily affect people uh, with normal immune systems. It does live in the urinary system. And the first time it was diagnosed was when a patient who had a transplant was noted that he had a severe scarring in his urethra, in his ureter from his kidney, that tube that drains the kidney, uh, the urine from the kidney to the bladder. Uh, and after the kidney failed, they were able to look at the, the microscope and they saw these funny looking cells uh, that were large and virus in nature and they realized that this kidney was infected with uh, this polyoma virus. Uh, and so the, it, the name of the patient, those were her initials, it became BK virus. Now patients who are immunosuppressed, particularly kidney patients, we will see different viruses because um, your body is, a, you have these viruses within our own system uh, on a regular basis, but when you're not immunosuppressed, they don't cause a problem. But when you're now on immunosuppressive therapy, viruses don't ever go away, they just stay dormant and they come to the surface when there's an opportunity because now your defenses are down. And so for transplant patients, CMV is another virus, cytomegalovirus that we monitor. BK is more evident in the urine. Uh, and so BK virus can manifest itself as a nephropathy. It can cause inflammation. Uh, we can measure it in your urine. We want to make sure oftentimes we can check to see how much you're excreting and it can be treated uh, most, uh, most often with um, lowering immunosuppression because generally it's the virus, viruses take over when your body is over immunosuppressed sometimes. And so it's important to lower your, uh, your immunosuppression and watch to see whether the virus uh, will decrease in number. For many patients, we'll take them off the steroids or we'll lower the mycophenolate to see, allow the body its ability to heal, fight that virus and slowly get rid of it. We oftentimes patients will never, may never get rid of it, but it may go less than 5,000 counts, less than 10,000 counts. And so we don't worry about it at that range. When it gets into large amounts like over uh, 250,000 being seen in a spot of urine or in the millions, then oftentimes we'll pull out some antiviral medications to treat. And because it is inflammation, you have to follow the creatinine. You want to make sure that, that, that you treat that virus to make sure it doesn't cause continuous scarring or inflammation within the kidney, just like any other infection, not bacterial, but now it's virus. So thank you very much for that question. The other virus we talked about was CMV. CMV oftentimes is manifested while it can be seen in the kidney. It most often causes uh, CMV pneumonia. It can cause CMV enteritis. Oftentimes you see it in the GI tract with patients who may have issues. Uh, so it's much more in other organs than, than BK virus. But uh, again, another virus that is common amounts of population, but is more manifested after your immune system has been compromised. For some reason, bone marrow transplant patients, we see much more also BK virus in that population of transplant patients. We see it somewhat with livers, but not as, as much as to do with kidneys. Like I said, it tends to be more associated with um, infection in the kidney. But it's, those are the, the two important viruses that we generally will monitor patients consistently after the transplant because it can be, it, the source of it can be from the donor or it may just be your own virus that has been present that's now being activated because you are on large amounts of anti-rejection medicine. So I appreciate that question. Again, I'm Dr. Scantberry. I am a medical consultant for Dialysis Patient Citizens Educational Center. And I'm here today to answer your questions and to talk about whatever topic you want to discuss related to dialysis, transplantation, getting on the waiting list, uh, modes of dialysis, how long should you wait before you 
uh, get a transplant, get on a transplant list, how long does it take to get on a transplant list? Um, and also, you know, what can you do to optimize your, your condition to get on the waiting list? And we know that many of the things that keep patients waiting is the routine health, uh, health maintenance. So if you are that age that you need a colonoscopy and you need a, a mammogram or a pap smear for men, your PSA, make sure that those are all up to date and go ahead and get those done because they can hold up the process. Uh, currently, as I try to get patients scheduled for colonoscopy, some of them have taken four to six months. So if you're waiting to get that done, to get on a transplant list, it may hold you up. So it's important because it, we want to make sure that you are not at risk for cancer. So please get your, your health mental screenings done. And even if you had a transplant, uh, make sure you get yourself a primary doctor who can order these tests for you and continue to stay healthy. So question is, what is the latest information about COVID and dialysis transplant world? Well, we know that the CDC has just recommended that for those who are immunocompromised and those who are over age 65, if you have had your vaccine uh, four months ago or greater, that it's time for you to get uh, another booster because yeah, we know that the antibodies wane over time. And when that happens, you are more at risk for uh, getting, a, getting a COVID infection that's going to keep you hospitalized. Remember, the vaccines are not going to keep you from getting COVID. What it is going to do is to give you enough antibodies so you can stay out of the hospital, so that you can keep you from getting severely ill. People say, well, you know, I got my vaccine and I still got COVID. That's not the point. The point is to keep you from being hospitalized, especially if you have multiple risk factors uh, whether you're immunocompromised, uh, whether you have um, uh, on anti-rejection medicine, uh, whether you're older, uh, have autoimmune diseases, all those things are important. So get your, if you are in that range, I suggest you talk to your primary doctor and think about getting that vaccine if it's been, if your last booster was in October, September or October last year then you're just about within that four month period. So I encourage you to talk to your doctor about it. What kind of virus can affect a kidney transplant? As I said before, we generally monitor post-transplant patients, especially for CMV and BK virus. Certainly um, those are the two most common that we see. Most of the viruses that we worry about are usually things that would be in the lung but we know that the kidneys are a, a hiding place for BK virus. You may not find it uh, in many other, in any, any significant other places. Uh, we do a biopsy. When we biopsy the kidneys, we often look for the viral inclusion bodies and it can do special stains to see if the virus is uh, inhabited the kidney and it's, it's in there. We know that BK virus can often cause strictures or narrowing in, in the ureter that drainage tube that takes the, the urine from the kidney to the bladder. Uh, and so we will monitor the urine for that. Uh, those are primarily other than the two biggest virus. The, within the transplant patient uh, population, uh, the other only other uh, important thing that we follow is generally um, uh, uh, PCP pneumonia, which often many patients are on Bactrim for a short period of time to prevent that, which is a pneumonia. But BK virus can cause a nephropathy and patients can lose their kidney from BK virus uh, because the, the medications for BK are not as effective as they are for CMV. So there's CMV prophylaxis medicine. We do pro CMV screening, it can be in the kidney, but you can detect that earlier and there are antivirals for CMV that are, that are much more, uh, cause the virus is much more responsive than BK virus. So it becomes important for BK, not necessarily treatment, which <clears throat> not, it, it involves allowing your body to fight off that virus by lowering your immunosuppression and making adjustments in your immunosuppression. 
when that happens, we have to then be very careful with that patient because while we're trying to help them get rid of the, the virus by lowering immunosuppression, we then can open up an avenue for rejection. So it's sort of a, a seesaw effect to, um, for many patients. We overcome the virus, but now you have rejection. So it's a very difficult, uh, can be a very difficult course for many patients. So from the time you're transplanted, we monitor that most patients, most centers will monitor that BK virus uh, dependent uh, to make sure you're, it's not present. And if it is present to see whether it's becoming a problem, whether it's affecting your creatinine, whether or not you need a kidney biopsy to see whether it's causing um, nephropathy or changes in yeah, inflammation in your kidney. So thank you for that question. Uh, welcome Tim Smith and uh, Jennifer, welcome. Thank you for showing up and being here and Keith, thank you for that question again. I am Dr. Scanderberry. I am the medical consultant for Dialysis Patient Citizens and we have about eight or nine minutes left. So uh, if there are any other questions that we can discuss, uh, certainly we talked about COVID we're now all over the flu season, so I hope all of you are doing well and have not um, been exposed to anyone with the flu. Although last year I knew many of my patients still got the flu in April, so stay safe. It's not over yet. Uh, fortunately here the weather's gotten a little bit cold, so we're back inside again. But continue to wear your mask. Be safe because it's important to, to make sure to realize that infections are still being passed around and you want to be safe. So practice uh, with hand sanitizers, wear your mask if that's what makes you comfortable uh, and don't get intimidated because other people are not wearing a mask and you should take your mask off. As I just had a couple patients with uh, severe flu infections and pneumonia because they thought it was over. So be cautious, continue to uh, stay away from those who are sick, especially now that you know Easter is around the corner. Many of you will be gathering. If you're gathering inside uh, and you know someone, especially with kids around who are coming over, uh, be careful. Tell them, you know, be, if they're sick, sick, stay away. Or if they can't stay away, make sure you are in a different vicinity. Um, no hugging, no kissing, you know, the normal stuff. Uh, and practice, be sure to wash your hands as often as possible. That's important. Uh, we Generally, it's the hand-to-mouth action. You touch something, you go wipe your nose or wipe your face, uh, and there you go, you've just transferred those germs. So if you can, the good thing about wearing a mask is that it keeps your hand away from your face, if nothing else, uh, because we tend to do that so often without realizing that. So I appreciate all of you being here. Uh, few minutes left. Uh, again, be careful, get your vaccination, uh, stay up to date, make sure for those of you who are on dialysis, if you're waiting for a kidney transplant or you have been called and are disappointed because it didn't work out, remember you'll get another call. Many patients who are uh, on, the, uh, on the waiting list will get called several times before they actually have to have that kidney for them because off, as a transplant surgeon, I will call two or three patients and have them be ready and waiting, even though the kidney may not have been allocated from, to me. But I wanna make sure that those two people who are allocated to, if it falls out, then you will be next. And if you ate, then uh, you just missed that opportunity or we'll have to wait another uh, four to six hours because if you had a meal, your the anesthesiologist is not going to put you to sleep. So certainly you want to be you you want to be prepared. I tell people if you've been called and you've had your number of years waiting, uh, and you know till you're up there uh, in terms of your name coming up depending on the donor, uh, make sure that for many people, uh, oftentimes if you're dialyzed. Uh, we will send you to your dialysis unit, so go get your dialysis, um, be ready, don't eat, and we'll let you know if we need to bring you in. So you want to make sure that you're free of infections and let your transplant surgeons, uh, uh, your transplant coordinator know if there's something going on with you because you don't, while you, you 
want to go into the hospital if when they call you if you have a urine infection or foot infection they're going to send you back home so let them know up front and most of all you want to keep it with your testing oftentimes we call a patient in and we realize that they didn't have the stress test that they should have had last year so keep up to date with your especially your cardiac testing that's most important because they want to make sure that when you're put to sleep that you're going to do well especially if you have uh, been on dialysis a while uh, and you're at risk for heart disease because of long-term diabetes and long-term uh, hypertension so we want you also want to be well well dialyzed because when patients are not well dialyzed uh, generally there's much more bleeding and that can maybe really complicate uh, the post-operative course especially if that kidney is not um, doesn't open up immediately and doesn't make enough urine you want to be able to avoid dialysis so if you are well dialyzed, dialyzed then we can skip and wait another day or two and allow that kidney to uh, take on the challenge of that extra fluid and then allowing you to uh, do better because we're not having to put the kidney into shock to dialyze it because your potassium is too high or you have too much fluid on board and while we're, the kidney may not be making enough urine but you may be in congestive failure but now because we also gave you enough uh, plenty of fluid during the operation and now we have to dialyze it out so not all kidneys work right away but you want to make sure we can get you through that period where your kidney is struggling to open up because of the shock of being uh, moving from one body to another or being transported being on ice for a while uh, and that delay can often uh, generally with a with a good nephrologist and dialysis they can just dialyze you to get rid of some of those bad um, bring your BUN or lower the potassium but not take away the fluid because you don't want to cause the kidney to go into shock so you want to make sure that your heart can handle the oftentimes patients can be uh, seven or eight or even as much as 10 kilograms over their weight uh, after the surgery because of all the extra medications and fluid that they receive so we want to make sure that your heart's doing well uh, and that that kidney can recover appropriately so thank you so much for all of you who have um, tuned in today uh, if you have any more questions we have about three minutes left I thank you all for showing up um, Milton says he's a home dialysis patient and a patient advocate and uh, continue to do that because we need to advocate for, for each other we need to share our stories and let others know in whatever setting you can whether it's your community center whether it's your church uh, also go out to um, uh, to health fairs work with your kidney foundation work with your uh, dialysis patient season work with the American Kidney Fund anything that's involved in educating our communities about learning more about kidney disease learning know how to be monitored uh, telling others about getting their urine checked for protein urea even if they feel fine knowing that kidney disease is silent and so many people are unaware uh, until they end up in the emergency room because fatigue and shortness of breath and swelling of the legs or just generally feeling miserable uh, can be due to so many different things and you do not necessarily have a decrease in your a decrease in the amount of urine you're putting out you people will say I, you know but I'm making urine in the same amounts how could I how could my kidneys not be working I don't feel that badly uh, and so it's a silent disease so I encourage you to share your story uh, on Facebook Instagram blog about it uh, let other people know that to check their numbers tell the doctors learn what your creatinine is learn what it's doing from year to year and if you uh, ever had any protein very important so thank you so much we're up on the hour it's 12 59 there are no more questions and um, I see you guys are all greeting each other uh, Jean to Julie, Julie to Jean, have a great day, continue to do well, uh, and um, spread the word, be more aware of kidney disease, and share your story. So, 
Thank you guys. Have a great day and enjoy the rest of your week and enjoy your Easter holiday until we meet again and see you next month. Take care. Have a wonderful day.